Ladies and gentlemen, a uh, very good morning to each and every one of you, wherever you may be in our beautiful country this morning. My name is John Kennedy, and it's my pleasure on behalf of my little colleagues to welcome you and to thank you for streaming in and for spending the time with us. Uh, we sincerely hope that during the course of the next couple of sessions, talking about remarkable retirement, you'll be challenged. We will give you food for thought. You will get insight, you'll get experience, and perhaps a couple of lessons learned from both internal and external experts in this space. Uh, we really, really are excited to be spending the time with you. If I can share a little bit more about the Citadel business, I've been in the Citadel group for the last 19 years, but if there's one sort of key pattern that we've learned about in engaging with people and building relationships with people uh, over the course of the 27 years of existence in Citadel or as Citadel group, um, we've realized that there's one core pattern and that life is messy and the unexpected happens, and the future surprises us, and things happen in our lives that were never there. And no better time to probably describe that than to just think about 2020, and we all know the crazy year that we've had, the very distracting, the very disruptive year that we've had, and we find ourselves now in October thinking about what happened and where we were at the end of December last year and the January of this year is, is we could just never join the dots. And so probably in the context of 2020 that we're having, no better time than to give thought to our own lives and our own strategies and our own plans and our own thoughts and to pull that all together by talking about retirement, the transition into retirement, leading in pre and post, so obviously retiring, and the lives that we choose to lead. And so the session today, the Remarkable Retirement Session, will focus on retirement from a number of angles. Of course, being a wealth management business, we will definitely be talking about some of the financial aspects. Um, and some of the lessons to be learned, but we're going to be sort of focusing on retirement from both the mental aspect, the emotional aspect, the spiritual aspect, the um, financial aspect, the estate planning aspect. So how do we end well? And some of the key lessons that we've learned through the course of the last 27 years and our experience of working with clients um, and some of the, you know, some of the, the common, you know, the common pitfalls that people find themselves. We are asking that you please participate as well. Um, the webinar space is in a perfect world. I'd love to sort of be with you together, sitting around a table talking about the subject. The webinar space makes it a little bit impersonal, um, but it does help us if you participate. And in the chat box, if you give us your comments, if you give us your thoughts, if you pose your questions, the intention is to, at the end of the session, to go into a Q&A with the panel and to answer your questions and to pick up on any point that gets made throughout the session. So in the chat box, please participate, share your thoughts, share your ideas, share your questions, and we'll deal with them later on and possibly between each of the speaker sessions as well. Just to give you one question to get the juices flowing, if you could possibly just share with us what you find most daunting about retirement. If you're about to go into the retirement phase, what it is that's troubling or worrying you, or if you are in you know, the early stages of being retired, you know, what challenges you? What do you find the most daunting aspect? And we'll pick on that a little bit later. Into introducing our first speaker, um, it's, it's, it's fantastic to have Dr. Anne Backlaws join us and is a guru in this space um, and is meant to be semi-retired, but I, I get the sense in engaging with Anne. I don't know how, how retired you are, Anne, um, and you've had a very, very active career and you're meant to be retired, but it, as I said, it doesn't seem like it. Um, but I think you approach retirement from such a holistic sort of perspective and, and sort of in your introduction, you often talk about a fulfilling retirement and a fulfilling retirement has got so many different dimensions to it. I'm going to lead into you and I'm going to step back and you can get into your presentation. But I want to ask the question because you did your doctorate, which I found incredibly fascinating on how to live successfully at home, um, you know, in your retirement and to live successfully at home for as long as possible in retirement. Perhaps maybe just using that as a springboard. Just share with us what was, you know, it's an interesting piece of sort of, of, of research and a starting point. Why did you start there? You know, what was that all about? Thank you very much, John. I didn't intend to do my doctorate in uh, looking at a socioeconomic problem, but I was very privileged when I was working in the Middle East. I, my father became very ill. And I was able to leave the work I was doing there as a management consultant and come home and spend the last six months with him. And it made me very aware of how much support we all need if we want to be in our own homes for as long as possible. And there's a, a vast amount of practical support we need that I was able to give my father. 
But when I actually went into the research from a business point of view, from an economic point of view, I had some very strong expectations about what the answers would be. What are the real issues for people living in South Africa where we have very little social support? We have to, we have to provide our own support. And that, this is a worldwide problem. There are many countries across the world. They aren't first world, they aren't third world, but there isn't the support that's provided by the government or the institutions. I'll go back, I'll go into that in a little detail, but that's how I got into uh, looking at the whole aspect of what we require to retire. So I'm going to talk to everybody here, and it's great to be here, about a fulfilling retirement. I'm going to talk from my personal experience, and I'm going to talk from my professional um, experience as well, my research and business experience. But I challenge you to take it personally, to think about your personal experience, but also to bring to your thoughts your own personal capabilities, your skills, your experience, your professionalism, and your, your own wisdom, and think about yourselves. So what would a fulfilling, fulfilling retirement, what would that look like for you? What do you want? What do you want? need to do to get what you want. And we always say the, the money is half the story. It's an important half. But it's not only have you got enough money to retire, but it's what are you going to do when you retire and why do you need that money? Uh, I work now, one of the jobs I do now is I'm in a retirement consultancy. There are three partners. One is Irish, one is South African, you'll meet him later, Paul and myself. We're all a little eccentric. We have a website, you are most welcome to take a look. There's some quite good articles on there. And we have a book that is excellent. I say that because I didn't write it myself and you can get that off Amazon. And that gives you practical tips to retirement. But we actually call it rewiring, not retiring because Two reasons. One is retiring is a horrible word. It's got a whole lot of negative connotations and it doesn't tell you anything. Retiring is leaving from, but actually when we retire, we're leaving to, we're going to something. And in going to that, we have to think about it. We have to think about how we're going to create this remarkable future for ourselves. So we talk about rewiring. My personal story, I told you a little bit. I was working as a management consultant in Amman, near Muscat. I was loving it. I really enjoyed the job. I had uh, interesting um, people to work with. I was working with Amman Oil, which is a holding company in Amman. And I had no intention of leaving it. But while, while I was thinking about what I was going to do next in my job and my travel plans, my father got very ill. And as Don was saying at the beginning, life is turbulent. We make plans, but we need contingency plans, and we also need sometimes to change lanes, to change what we were doing. So I went home and I spent time with my father, and what a privilege. I spent six months with him. I was able to support him and my stepmom during the process of the end of his life. And as a result, I changed the work I was doing for my doctorate, and I looked at, uh, excuse the long words, but domiciliary support services is really, what do you need if you want to stay in your home when you retire, as you get older? And I went into that research with very fixed ideas. I was fairly sure what I would see as answers, and I did the research to get a really good statistical result about all the things that are important for elderly people living in their own homes. And what I found was there's very little research on retirement in non-Europe, non-America. There's a little bit in, in Japan, not all of it printed in English. There's some good research done in Australia and some research done in South America, but very little considering 
how many people are going to end up in that social situation. And I was constantly looking at it from my business consultant hat. So this is what I found, that there are specific themes of need. This is what I called it, themes of need being what people look at and what people need and what they mention as needs. So I looked at not only what, what do people mention as needs for themselves, but what do counselors and people who deal in this space, how do they look at what people need? And much to my surprise, the top theme of need was about loneliness. It was about, and it's crazy. There are so many lonely people. That just seems like an oxymoron. How they, can there be a lot of lonely people? But this is what came out so strongly. Loneliness, people wondering about the reason for living, people wondering about what they were going to do with their lives, how they were going to stretch out this long, interminable retirement, and what they're going to do with it. Certainly, costs came up very strongly. It's good that you, you've joined a webinar about investment and how to, how to maintain your wealth, because people were looking more at the side of seeing inflation. When people retire, they become very aware of inflation because they buy things on a regular basis. Cost was a very strong concern. But the third concern that came up as well was support. Emotional, psychological and support during difficult situations. So that's 29, nearly a third of the issues that strike people when they're retired and are living in home are not practical issues. It's not about who's going to fix my computer and where do I get a plumber and travel bookings and all that. It's really about uh, about meaning and value and doing something that's worth doing. So what, what I have found, and now I am semi-retired, I haven't traveled to the Middle East for a year and I don't see myself traveling until the end at least of this year, then I'll go back and do some consulting. And I'm also doing a course on data analysis through Harvard, fascinating topic. But how I'm dealing with it is I've found I've had to change lane. I've had to, I've had to stop looking at the lane that I was in and thinking this is where I'm heading. And I, I really do find myself slowing down. I, uh, I don't cycle as fast as I used to. <laughs> I don't think as fast as I used to. This darn data, data analysis course I'm sure was designed for millennials because it's taking me longer to learn some of the software than I'm sure others. But I don't want to crash. And I'm sure you don't want to crash either. And I'm sure if you're listening as a, as a, as partners, and we hope you are, I'm sure you don't want your partner to crash. If you're listening and thinking of your parents, you don't want your parents to crash. So how do you deal with it? How do you avoid hitting, which Paul will talk about, how do you avoid hitting the wall due to the terrible things that can it can feel to be lonely, unneeded? So this is what I'm looking at. I'm looking at protecting my assets, which I put in this order of health, wealth, and relationships. These are all really important assets, I think, to anybody. I've developed new interests. My husband and I have started sailing. We sail every year in Greece. I've extended my oil interests. I've completely redone my garden. And I'm thinking about legacy. I'm thinking about not just me. What am I leaving? not just to my children, but what am I doing that's going to last beyond me? And I do think that's one of the keys is whatever you do, it should have an impact outside you. It's not enough to keep yourself happy. That's the one way to be unhappy. I just want to make a little bit of a comparison, thinking about where we are right now, between COVID-19 and retirement. Even the best were not prepared enough. Even people who had contingency plans layered were not prepared for this black swan event. And it was sudden, everything changed. And I think the reality is that retirement doesn't necessarily come at the date you expect. It could be sudden. You could suddenly sell your company, get a good offer. You could suddenly 
find that they've changed the retirement age from 65 to 62. And the world you experience once you take full-time work out of it becomes smaller. You go to fewer places, you see fewer people, you have fewer conversations. And one of the things that I, I found that is universal is you find your range of people shrinking. You end up in a place where you see fewer people of different of different interests, of different ages, you you find your world does shrink, much like it shrunk for us all in COVID-19. So now I'd like to talk to you about, about blue zones. There's been some very interesting research that was done about blue zones. Dan Butner looked at towns where people live much longer than in similar towns. And it's men and women, living well into their 90s, into their hundreds, healthy, active, taking part. And what's the secret? What's the secret sauce that these people are eating, drinking, or smoking? If you look around the world as well, it's clearly not genes because it's from people from California to Costa Rica to Okinawa, Sardinia, Corsica, and I would also add a, an extra one I'm talking to, Don Kennedy. I think Simon's time probably falls into this category as well. There seem to be a lot of active older men in Simon's time where I live. So what's, what is happening in these blue zones that people are living a fulfilled life? What do they have in common? Well, at first glance, not very much. The Adventists eat nuts and beans, have a Sabbath day of rest, great idea, have faith and don't drink alcohol. The Sardinians, on the other hand, do drink alcohol and they drink red wine. And they share the work burden with their spouse, it's often physical work, and they eat cheese and omega, three rich foods. The Okinawans, on the other hand, living in Japan, are living in a community where there's a lot of connections in the community. They eat small portions, and there's a lot of emphasis in Okinawa on finding purpose, joining clubs, taking part, being involved. Uh, there's a lot of social support for activities in Okinawa. So what do they all do? What's the common feature that these people across the globe have got right. And the good news is it's not that complicated. It's really not that that secret source is available to all of us. Don't smoke, watch your health, put your family first, really concentrate on on building your 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 community, your tribe. They are active every day, rain or shine. They keep socially engaged. They do not hide behind the walls and go out once a fortnight to the pub. They're very socially engaged. And they concentrate what they eat on mostly fruit, veg, and grains. And red wine doesn't seem to make a difference. You can if you want. You don't have to. <laughs> so how would we go about creating our own blue zone? It's not a zone. It's not a place. It's a way of living that we can create. I love this picture. Um, too bad of his underpants show. He's having a great time and with his family, with a mixture of ages, outdoors, in the sun. And what we learned from Blue Zones, and I encourage you, go and have a look at the research. It's easy to find on the internet. How to live longer and happier. Belong to a small tribe. Really belong. Create your tribe. You can't choose your family. You might be like, me and have your children all around the world, but you can choose your friends and you can be a friend. You can really be a good friend to other people. You can choose people who have similar interests, people who you can trust, who support you and encourage you to stay active. Do things with your friends. Don't just sit and talk to them. <laughs> and even now, we can do a few things with a few friends. And try to make it possible to be involved multi-generational. I think that's one of the biggest things I notice about these beautiful retirement villages. 
they're gorgeous, but you don't hear laughter and you don't see kids. And I think we need to do something about making sure we still have laughter and children and noise and parties in our lives. I'd like to tell you the story of a man I met uh, last year. Amazing guy, well into his 70s. So when he finished tobacco farming, he went to sugar farming. When he went and then he retired and he went and worked in Elgin as an, as an apple farmer manager. And then he decided, no, this wasn't challenging enough. And he has now opened a B&B near Hrutfaderbosch and he's breeding buffalo. And he's had a succession since he's retired of different things. And, and he's, his financial needs have had to keep track of that. Sometimes he's been investing heavily, sometimes he made good income. A buffalo sells for between a million and 40 million uh, and 40 million rand. And he's considering about distribution to his family and grandchildren. So when we think about our own retirement, we shouldn't think about it as a retirement plan. And we certainly shouldn't think about a plan that we're going to do and then we're going to activate it over and over and over again. I'm sure I'm talking to people who, on a professional basis, do a lot of planning. You would never look at a 25-year or 15-year deadline and do a one-year plan and plan to repeat it 15 or 20 times. So we actually need a retirement strategy. We really need to think about the strategy for our retirement, put short-term plans, the thing I'm going to do the first day I retire, um, the thing I'm going to do for the first year, what I'm going to do, medium plan, contingency plans. We really should have a retirement strategy. And we talk about rewirement, and this is how our retirement uh, consultancy looks at the three core parts. Have purposeful activity. That's activity, plural, activities. Do things with purpose. It's fantastic to get your, to play more golf. It's fantastic to cycle more, sail more. But you can't do that every day. You should have, also have activities that build up other people, that generate long-term results, that, that are, are good for your relationships as well. Fun and recreation, it is awesome to live some of those dreams. Uh, my husband and I sell every year and we look forward to it. We are bitterly missing it this year. It's awesome to have the time, to have the fun that you've been dreaming about. But even dreams take plans. If you're doing daylight dreaming, not nighttime nightmare dreaming, you need to plan around it. And Paul will talk a little bit more about setting and, and reaching goals. So I'd like to finish by saying, I'd like you to think about a strategy for your retirement. Use your imagination, use your dreams, use your family and friends and advisors to help you. Thank you. So Anne, stay online. Let me come in here. Let me let me just first caution everybody from rushing out and going and buying buffaloes. <laughs> um, you, you made something I think which was incredibly relevant, and I touched on it. You know, the messiness of 2020 has made our walls incredibly smaller. Um, and so my question to you is this: in the context of 2020, but just more broadly, do you think that retirees stop dreaming? Do they stop sort of thinking about, you know, whatever it is that, you know, that they're passionate about and sort of dream into the future? I, I think that, I think that we, I think that we naturally become more um, risk averse as we get older. And that can turn into fear. It can go way to the wrong extreme of being frightened. And we really need to hold on to our dreams. I mean, I'm 65. I don't think that's old enough to stop doing something new. And I think it's wonderful to dream, to make it happen, to have several dreams. I, I 
think what I see a lot is people think of retirement in quite a simple way and they don't make it rich enough. They don't dream rich enough. They don't dream. It's, it's a lot of time that you get when you retire. We found that when we've been stuck at home in COVID-19, you suddenly got a lot of time. And we need to have rich dreams and rich plans and and we need to involve other people in them and we need to expect some new unexpected good things that we can grab. Uh, Paul talks a lot about volunteering and I must say I'm very impressed at how people during this COVID-19 lockdown have looked around and helped in their community and how much there is to do in your community and how satisfying that is, how, how it's very easy to get involved in something that's really worth doing. And by getting involved, I'm not saying 100% of your time, but to just give a good portion of your time to something that you feel is really worth it. That's one of your reminders to dream. <laughs> so I couldn't agree with you more. I think if anything that that was highlighted this year was how people stepped up, you know, from a volunteering point of view and how communities came together. And um, I didn't plan, plan to mention this, but it was just fascinating to me in that first phase of when lockdown went, whenever it went from level five to level four, whenever, but, but when we got that six to nine in the morning freedom and how people were walking in the streets and all of a sudden you got to see your neighbors because they were, you know, we had this limited window to be out and that community coming together. Um, it was fascinating to see how people can step up. Um, you, I get the next slot. So you, you spoke about having a retirement strategy. So folks, my slot is about having a financial strategy. So I'm going to just share my slides. Um, and, you know, of course it goes without saying that, you know, a core part or core pillar of your retirement strategy is your financial strategy. And so, I'm going to be quite big picture and then I'm going to get quite granular with you and sort of try and share and probably just, you know, give credence to how important it is to have some kind of roadmap that is thought through and purposeful, you know, and speaks to your desired lifestyle. And I'm going to frame it like this, that in our experience in working with, with private clients, we, as a human nature, typically think in the present. We think in the now. And we become short term in our mindset and sometimes trapped in the short term noise of it all and then project that noise into the future and it causes us anxiety. And it's just human nature, you know, information that we're picking up in the sources of just it breeds anxiety when one thinks short term. And so what we try and do and what I want to try and illustrate is that there is a bigger picture. There is a much bigger picture to think about building a strategy and it's to avoid or stop looking in the foreground the whole time and actually look into the distance and start to think longer term and start to see life as a timeline um, and on your screen, looking at it from left to right, but a timeline of life. And um, one thing we've always said is that each of us has a story and each of us sort of has our own journey along it. But there are there's some commonality to it. And we all understand that we go into a phase of life where you know, we go into that learning phase where we pick up our knowledge and our skill sets that it gives us the opportunity to hopefully earn and go into an earning phase and pick a lane, an occupation, a career, a business, an industry, a sector, whatever it might be. And at some point in time, we face whether we're pushed into it or it is of our own election, whatever the case might be, we go into a phase where we now retire. And I like your phrase, Anne, of rewire, but we hopefully get to live and end well. And so with that as a backdrop, I really want to talk to building a financial strategy around living well and ending well. And the ending well will allow me to introduce the next speaker when I'm done. And so there are a few things just to highlight as guidelines, just to set the scene. The first point that I just want to make is that when you build a financial strategy, you focus on your controllables, which is your personal economy. We are, and I suppose, in our business, but just generally, everybody looks at the national economy. Everybody looks at the global economy. I've seen in some of the chats already, people allude to it of, you know, what the future might look like and what it might deliver to us. And then we onboard that anxiety with very little control over it. The fact of the matter is when you're dealing with your own financial strategy, you want to focus on your personal economy. And we've always said, and then live by design. Give thought to your life. Give thought to your life throughout your life, where you want to be. 
think about your situations and your own set of circumstances throughout the seasons. Um, we become quite short term, as I mentioned earlier, but it really is to try and, try and stretch our mindsets and look through the seasons. And then to map it out and to put numbers to it. And the point that I suppose I asked you, Anne, was to say, don't ever forget to dream and to dream wildly and to set goals and to dream without fear and to enjoy the fruits of your labor and the fruits of what you have, as an individual or a household have created over a 30 year plus time period. And so when we look at the, the balls that we're all juggling and what we do when we build these analyses and these roadmaps for our clients is a starting point is obviously always looking at the timeline. How long do I need to think about, you know, is it 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? What is it? In our experience, and when we look at the tables and we look at the sort of just generally what's going on, our clients, you yourselves that are listening, have the capacity to live to 95. You'll start to see a lot more stats of people living beyond 100. I have three beautiful daughters. I have no doubt if they are able to or if they good fortune that they will live well into their hundreds, just given what's happening in medical sciences. And so when we start to talk about a financial strategy, it's a strategy that's not just about tomorrow, as I mentioned, it is a long-term strategy. We also have to accept that there are phases that we will go through around our own energy levels and our mobility. And the other variable that obviously needs to be considered is how do I want to live? You know, what should I be thinking about, you know, to support well, my lifestyle? How do I want to live? And will my asset base support that? Um, and I'm not going to, this is a financial strategy, this is not an investment strategy, so I'm not going into the investment strategy, but I am going to assume that once you've designed your lifestyle, you will have the asset base to support it. And so let me jump right ahead and forgive the busyness of this slide, but when you, when you finish this process and you've given thought, what you ultimately should have is a roadmap of numbers, but with color, which ultimately gives you enough insight into how your finances are going to unfold over a long period of time and gives you insight into what you need to control and i'm going to break each of these segments down with you you know in in one by one so let's start out i mentioned that what we're, we're trying to do is build a roadmap you know for your for your lifetimes and my first ask is that when you build a roadmap or build your financial strategy to the extent that you can involve your loved ones Involve your partner, involve your children, get them to understand the roadmap that you're looking to design for themselves. It becomes incredibly empowering, it becomes incredibly exciting, and it actually takes a lot of the sensitivities that one faces late in life away. The first point is obviously put time to it. How much time are we talking about? You know, if I am 65 and I want to take myself to 95, well, that's 30 years. That's not 2030, that's not 2040, that's 2050. That's a long time into the future. If I'm 60, if I'm 55, if I'm older, obviously one's got to, you know, change the number. But it's a long time. The next point is to acknowledge that there are a number of phases that I'm going to go into in this last third of my life. Um, when I retire, I'm going to be active. I'm going to have more time to do the things that I've ever, you know, possibly sort of dreamed or had before. And so I'm going to be active and I'm going to be traveling and I'm going to be entertaining. I'm going to follow my passions and my hobbies. And at some point in time, not definitive, but at some point in time, as I saw with my parents and I've seen with you know, our clients, you start to become a lot more passive and your lifestyle and your expenses change. And at some point in time, potentially, you will go into more of a supported phase, whether supported by family or supported in a lifestyle village or supported in frail care, whatever it might be, it's a reality to consider. And so with that as a top down, look at it. It then really becomes about, well, let's articulate the lifestyle that we want to live. How do we want to do it? And when we think about it, let's just put ourselves into the future. We obviously want to start where we are today and sort of use that as the bedrock, but let's think about where we would want to be in 2025 and who we'll be with and how we're going to want to spend our money and where we're going to want to travel. And so my next point would be to say, you bring in two sets of expenses. You bring in your regular expenses and you bring in your lump sum expenses. You know, and regular expenses are the typical things that come, you know, money goes out the bank account, you know, on an ongoing basis every month. And your lump sum expenses are sort of ad hoc capital amounts that, that you need to con give consideration to. And so if I, if I hone in on regular expenses, top down, we're starting with the timeline and the phases. But from a bottom up, what I suggest one always does is to start really at the bottom and say, 
what does it cost me to run my household? You know, and those are the things that we're all familiar with. How much does it cost me to feed myself, my partner, and whoever else that lives with me? Uh, how much does my municipal uh, bills, uh, you know, how much does my electricity cost me? What are my levies? Do I have, you know, do I pay any external security provider? Who are my service providers? What are my debit orders? You know, what does my cell phone cost me? You know, all of these good things. What does my insurance cost me? You know, how much do I spend on my garden every month? One can really get quite granular with this and get granular with it throughout one's timeline. That is an obvious place to start. And the next obvious place to start is, you know, what are my medical costs? Now, we know in South Africa that we need to have, you know, we need to provide for our medic, uh, medical requirements. We don't have a social system uh, to be able to cater for that for us sort of adequately. So, you know, I always say to people, engage with a specialist to get the right medical aid, you know, at the right price for your set of circumstances. And bring into that consideration a medical buffer, because I think we all understand that there are these ongoing costs that creep in on the medical side, which we need to cover for. Then giving thought to... How are we going to uh, how are we going to seek entertainment and what our hobbies are and what are what you know how are we going to seek entertainment and hobbies through the active and passive side that side and what will those be and what amount will that be and then general maintenance uh, costs and sort of building this up and saying well we're going to be replacing a carpet we're going to need to fix a roof we're going to need to buy a new laptop at some point in time whatever that might be. We need to replace car tires. One brings that number to it. And then to dream and give thought about, do we like traveling? Is it local travel? Is it international travel? Where do our children reside? Where do our grandchildren reside? And putting a number to that. And, and typically what one will see, and I'll, I'll display it just now, is that you know the, the, the travel has a, has a finite lifetime to it. And if you're in the fortunate position to be able to support family, and I think this is a reality in South Africa as well, to either pay for grandchildren's education costs or in any other way, or you want to be more charitable in your giving, then to think about legacy and family-related costs. And these are all the sort of things that when one talks about, as Anne left it and handed over to me around a budget, but it forms part of your strategy. And it really should give you sort of context to think about what is the regular spend and sort of to map that out over a period of time. We then talk about lump sums. Now, what are those lump sums? Lump sums are starting from the top and working my way down. There will be moments in life where you will need a medical uh, a lump sum to cover some or other medical expense that medical aid or your medical buffer won't cover. There will be moments at different points where you will need to access uh, an amount of capital to repeat myself that will you will require for, for some unforeseen medical requirement. You will want to change your cars. What cars are you going to want to drive? What car would you go from being a two-car household to a one-car household? When will you want to do it? You know, it's, it goes without saying that one doesn't incur debt in the retirement phase. So you'll want to pay, you know, a capital amount for, you know, your car. And you may well need to think about home relocation. And in South Africa, what we often find is that the relocation from one home to another, with, you know, or from one place to a lifestyle village or whatever, is sometimes going for less in terms of physical space, but having to put more money in. And so one needs to give thought to that. And when could that be? And what the amount could be? And one maps this out. So one maps this out, both the regular and lump sum expenses over a long period of time. And you get a total amount, goes without saying. And the first point I want to make is that you should expect an upward slope. So I'm not displaying the numbers because, you know, in the context of, of a webinar, it becomes very busy to put all the numbers up. But you should expect an upward slope to your expenses over your lifetime purely because of inflation. And one of you mentioned inflation being a significant concern and getting a return on one's investment capital above inflation for this very real reason. There is general inflation that applies to our core household and other related costs. But then there's medical inflation. And what's got to understand that medical costs typically rise significantly above the general inflation rate. And so you've got a budget for all of these sort of things. And I will touch on it, but you will see those little sort of triangles, those little spikes in your expenses. Those are when your expenditure ramps up in any given year because you've got a capital cost, a vehicle, a home relocation, a medical contingency, whatever the case might be. And South Africans become quite overwhelmed by this because the numbers just become almost sort of telephone numbers over a long period of time. But that is the reality of inflation. It's got to form part of our financial strategy. I then just want to make a point of what actually happens to regular expenses throughout the time period. Um, you may not see all the words, but this is a block.
that effectively puts a percentage to your regular expenses, whether they be the core household expenses, the entertainment and hobbies, your travel, your general maintenance, your family related, your medical aid or your medical buffer. And you can see as you evolve through the different stages of life, certain expenses have a, have a time limit, certain expenses reduce, certain expenses increase markedly, so on and so forth. We often find, <coughs> excuse me, that, that people say we're going to spend less in you know later on in life. And that is that is true on the one side, that is true on certain expenses, but I can just highlight the two lines at the top there. You might read medical aid and medical buffer. You will see that they increase significantly from where they start. They start at roughly 10%, 10 to 15% of monthly spend, and they work their way very quickly to close to 20%, and if not more, of monthly spend. And so whilst other expense items reduce, those expenses increase, as does your core household expense. And so this is, this is a wonderful way of when you're building this financial strategy just to keep an eye on how things are evolving over time and whether you know, you're on track or not. The principle around ad hocs, as I alluded to earlier, <clears throat> is accept that you're going to get these moments when there's a capital cost, you know, where there's a significant capital cost of vehicles or medical or home relocation. And one of the points I made and, and didn't touch on it enough is that you should build the unexpected into your narrative, into your psyche, that the unexpected will happen. And as best as you way, best way to avoid it is forward looking around when you're going to need money and forward looking around when you're going to need capital. And if you're liquid enough, you'll always be able to manage and prepare well in advance, just whatever, regardless of whatever gets thrown at you from time to time. So that then comes back to that picture that I started out at, and I'm going to just have a sip of water and put the mute button on for, give me 10 seconds. It's not what any of you are thinking, I promise. It's just a frog in the throat. <laughs> um, but that gives you this beautiful picture at the end when you give consideration to all of the strategy that that sort of you know allows you to focus on your own personal economy and allows you to focus on your controllables you know and allows you to measure and understand where you are all the time and i think what it does do is that it takes a short term noise out of the picture and it gives you structure and allows you to take control so to speak so i i started out with that sort of table mountain i'm a Cape Townian, and I'm passionate about that picture and that mountain. And, and yes, and Simon's Town is on the one side of that picture on the far left. Um, but the choice is ours to live well and to end well and to, you know, to set the direction and the destination and then build a financial strategy to support that. So to develop a retirement strategy and allow the financial strategy to sort of underpin and embed that. This gives me an opportunity now to sort of finish up and focus on the end well part. and introduce Hilary Dudley to you. Hilary is the Managing Director of Citadel Fiduciary. And uh, Hills, it's wonderful to have you join us. Um, you know, this is an, an integral part, certainly in the last phase or the last third of one's life where one's got to give thought to how do we end well. It becomes incredibly complex. It becomes incredibly emotive, incredibly uh, sensitive. But it's a necessary conversation that needs to be had. And in our sort of speak, we talk about it as fiduciary and estate planning. Um, but perhaps maybe leading into you, you can you can speak to you know what is estate planning and and you know how people can choose to end well. Thank you, John, for that introduction. Be with me, please, while I drive my slides. Um, let me get started. There we go. Um, very good point, John. In order to end well, we need to plan well. And that takes time, not only during retirement, but possibly even and ideally before you enter your retirement phase. But it's never too late to start estate planning. Sorry. No problem. Oh, I can't drive after all. Don't say anything about female drivers. <laughs> I would never do anything like that. <laughs> that, would be, that would be crazy. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, if you're looking for trouble. 
<laughs> uh, I would indeed. I'm just interested. I can see the buffalo picture in the background there. So there's a there's a common theme that's coming through here. Oh. Fumbling around here. Don't stress. Uh, All good. Paste them under. There we go. See that. And maybe finally I can get going. Can you see that, John? Uh, we can. I think only part of the slides are coming up on the side. So that's what I can see. Okay. Are you starting your slides? Let me let me yeah. just see if I can do this as well from my side. Uh, Hilary Dudley, just see if your slides come up, Pills, there. Perfect. Okay, Thank and then you, you can just control it from your side. Oh, that is about the, the most technical knowledge I have around this system. So there you go. <laughs> that I could help. Luckily, you've got three younger people in your family to help you with that. Yeah, or tell um, me what yeah. to do quite right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that for the delay. I've been trying to get fancy with animations and it's come back to bite me. So I'll stick to the trial and tested method here. And John, just to pick up on, on what you said around estate planning, what is estate planning? I think it's really important to just revisit that to frame the discussion I'm going to have with you today. Because estate planning is the process by which you as an individual and your family, who I'll refer to in this session as your tribe, arranges the transfer of assets in anticipation of your death. Another way of looking at it is a, is a plan of administration and disposition, disposition of assets before or after your death, and you can use various tools to achieve this, including wills, trusts, donations, and documents like powers of attorney. So in other words, it's important to note that estate planning is a process, it's a strategy to pick up on Anne's comment earlier, and it also should be what I like to call organic. It can't be something you do once and then you, you can tick that block and it's done. You need to regularly review your estate plan, especially given that your and your family's personal circumstances can change over time. And as you said earlier, John, the future will surprise. There will be unexpected future events, those black swan events that Anne alluded to. And it's important that your estate plan is flexible enough to cater for that. And I think at this point as well, it's important to uh, highlight the issue of your potentially getting a trusted advisor to guide you through this process, not only in the development of your estate plan, but also the implementation of it. That trusted advisor need not necessarily be a professional. It could be someone in your family, in the next generation of your family, for example, who you've earmarked to partner with you through this process. Um, it is a multi-generational process and it does help to involve other family members in the process as you go. So where do you start uh, when considering your estate plan and perhaps at a granular level drafting a will? I always recommend that you start with yourself. Think about what is your legacy and in particular what do you owe to your heirs? There can be disappointments and expectations around inheritances where people think that they owed uh, money by their parents, they expect to inherit. But in reality, you have freedom of testation and you can elect to whom to bequeath your money. So have a think about what do you owe your heirs. And once you've come up with the answer, perhaps have a discussion with them to set their expectations and avoid any issues on your desk. Another important thing to consider is your wishes. Do you know what you want to achieve and how to achieve it? Do you have that strategy in place? And very importantly, what do you own and how? If you don't know what you own and how you own it, no one else is going to. So it's important to have that all recorded. And when looking at your assets, what you own, 
you can have consideration to uh, four different classes of assets. Firstly, your direct assets, which are assets that you own in your own name. And then indirect assets, which are assets you own via structures such as private companies or close corporations. And those kind of assets can be dealt with in your will. It's important to consider whether you need a will in more than one jurisdiction. And then if you're involved in a business, you might need some kind of agreement governing the business and the devolution of the shares in the business. How will that transfer on your death? Don't forget if you have a trust, whether it's a local or an offshore trust, that you should take that into account in your planning. Although you don't have personal control of trust assets because the trustees are, are the owners of those assets, you might need to, to take the trust into account. And then finally, looking at the fourth category, you have to look at your pension and life policies. Now, it's important to note that your pension in particular doesn't form part of your deceased estate on death. It's exempt from estate duty, it's exempt from executor's fees and so on. But you need to nominate beneficiaries on that pension. With life policies also, you need beneficiary nominations, but those policies, the proceeds they are potentially do form part of your deceased estate and may be subject to estate duty although the executor does not control those, those assets. So in other words, it's important not only to look at your will, but also your beneficiary planning on your pension and policies. And then looking at things holistically, it's really important to ascertain where these kinds of assets are situated, because you might need to take into consideration offshore legal considerations. The next thing you need to think about is your partner, your life partner, your spouse. Um, it's important, obviously, to take them and their needs into consideration when doing your estate planning. The, there is a legal duty of maintenance and support when you're married. Um, it's important to take into account your marital property regime. In other words, whether you're married in or out of community of property, because that will have an impact on your plan as well. Also, if you're in a situation where you're not legally married, but you're in a permanent life partnership, you need to be aware of the legal considerations there. There is a misconception that the concept of a common law spouse applies here in South Africa, and that if you live with someone for a certain amount of time, you'll receive rights and, and be able to inherit from them. And that's not the case at present. If you're not an heir in someone's will, or if you don't have a cohabitation agreement setting out your property rights, you don't have a legal claim. Although it seems that might change, there was a recent case in the Western Cape where the judge found that it's un unconstitutional to treat a permanent life partner uh, differently from a married partner in certain respects. So we'll probably see the law in that area developing, and it's important that you know what the implications for you are. If you've been divorced, it's important to update your will and reconsider your planning for a couple of reasons. One of which is that the Wills Act says that if you die more than three months after having divorced and you haven't removed your ex-spouse as the heir of your will, your will will still stand. So in other words, you're given three months to change your will and if you don't, you deem to have intended your ex to inherit. Divorce is obviously a very emotional and difficult situation, and it might be easy to overlook this kind of technicality. So again, it's important that you partner with someone who can give you advice. And as I alluded to, if you divorced and remarried, you need to take that into account in your estate planning too, because you would probably want to ensure that your new spouse is maintained and has adequate support, but at the same time want to protect your children's inheritance. And there are tools which can be used to achieve this. Moving on then to children. Uh, your tribe is growing, you're married, you've had kids, they're getting married and they're having children. It's very important to bear in mind the impact that in-laws can have on the family dynamic. In my experience, often issues arise as a result of queries from, from spouses arising um, they're perhaps not part of the family structure, or they're not aware of previous discussions that have been had. And it's important to include them in this and have them on sites. If you have minor children or grandchildren, in other words, under the age of 18, 
you need to think about nominating a legal guardian for them in your will. And in the case of grandchildren um, and minor children, ascertaining how you'll protect the inheritance for them because anyone under the age of 18 can't actually inherit in their own name. And if you don't provide in your will that the inheritance be held in a trust, it gets paid to the guardian's fund, which is administered by the master of the high court. And that you don't want. Other issues to think about, scenarios that you might have to plan for is if you have special needs heirs who have mental or physical challenges that prevent them from managing their own money or earning their own income. You can look at special needs trust, for example, that has a tax benefits. And an unfortunate but sad reality in your family, perhaps there's a substance abuse issue and you might need to plan for how to protect your, your heir's inheritance from those kind of issues. And then something we're seeing more and more in South Africa is a diaspora, if you can call it that, the migration of members of your tribe to other areas of the world. You need to perhaps take into account the impact of tax laws in the areas where they live and adapt your South African estate plan accordingly, um, partnering with someone who can give you advice in that foreign jurisdiction. Again, uh, multi-generational is a key word in the discussion we're having today. It's important to take your, the next generation into account in your planning. And by that, I don't only mean uh, uh, giving them money, but perhaps assisting them with their own estate planning. If you're fortunate and you have children who are very successful in their own rights and are building a significant estate of their own, you might be able to assist them with their planning by bequeathing their share of inheritance to a trust rather than to them personally. Again, it's important to engage and to be open and have this discussion with, with family members to ensure that things can work seamlessly and, and, and achieve what you want to achieve. I've alluded to trusts. You, you don't want to ex uh, forget about existing trusts in your estate plan. Um, you can't control the trust assets in your will. That's a no-no. But what you can do, for example, is nominate succeeding trustees in your will or leave a bequest to a trust. At the end of the day, the key is that it's all about scenario planning and strategy because you never know what might happen. And it's important that your plan can be effective if different situations arise and impact you and your tribe. Something that you shouldn't overlook in your planning as well is your ascendants, your parents or potentially even your grandparents. Um, not only may you inherit from them and, and potentially need to have that conversation with them about how best to structure your inheritance, but you may be in an unfortunate situation in your family where your parents are financially dependent on you because of the uh, uh, lack of funding or, or issues around retirement funding. And it's important to note that you actually have a legal duty to maintain your parents. Most of us know that parents have a legal duty to maintain their children, but it often comes as a, as a surprise when I mention to clients in consultations that there's a reverse duty as well. If your parents are indigent and you have money, you're legally obliged to look after them. And, and many people are in a situation where they're currently supporting their parents. And you need to put a plan in place to ensure that that financial support is not interrupted in the event of your death. So you now have built your, your immediate tribe. Um, you have now consideration to your wider tribe beyond your immediate family members, such as children and grandchildren. You might want to benefit or take into account siblings or other fam family members in your estate plan. And also, if you've got extra resources to share beyond your immediate family, you might want to share with your wider community uh, and, and make bequests to philanthropic organizations. Um, there was mention by Anne of volunteering in retirement. Perhaps if you don't own any time, you can also bequeath money to philanthropy. So now that you've built that picture and you have an idea of who is in your tribe, what their requirements are, what you want to achieve, uh, what legacy you would like to leave, you then need to 
place that picture within a legal and tax framework. And time doesn't permit us today to go into detail around that. So just conceptually, I'd like to say it's really important that you know what the laws are uh, that impact your estate planning, both here in South Africa and offshore, and, and what taxes are uh, applicable. Um, it's important that um, you can actually implement the documents as well. So getting advice on drafting your estate plan is important, but it's also important to partner with people who can help you implement it successfully. It's not much point at all having an amazing set of documents, legal documents that fall down because they're not properly implemented. So it's important to partner with the right people to help you achieve what you want. This is something that I often start a consultation with uh, a new client when I'm having an estate planning discussion. I call it my complexometer. And on the one hand of, uh, end of my complexometer is what I call the KISS principle. And my definition of the KISS principle is that uh, you have a clear and simple strategy. Basically, your intention is to minimize the tax you pay while you're alive because you're around to see it and, and it's uh, concerning if you end up paying more than you need to. But generally, the KISS principle entails you're not being too concerned about death duty. Um, often I have clients say, you know, my view is my heirs are lucky to inherit anything from me. Uh, it's a privilege, they shouldn't expect it. Um, I'm not too concerned if they inherit a bit less because of death duty. And then on the other hand, on the other end of the complexometer, uh, we have complexity, where you might have a complex estate planning strategy utilizing multiple structures locally and offshore. And the goal is to minimize tax paid while you're alive and after your death. Uh, your goal is to maximize your heirs' inheritance because you don't want them to receive 20 to 25% less because of death duty. What's really important then is for you to ascertain where you sit and where your tribe sits on this complexometer scale. Uh, whether you add naught wanting to keep it simple or at 100 wanting to get more complex. Because in my experience, you don't want to implement something that's too complex, that your family cannot understand and that you cannot understand. Because generally things fall apart and the wheels come off because of frustration and, and uh, the, the family not viewing the, the complex structures achieving what it needs to achieve. Um, you also need to be aware that on the complexity end of the scale, you're using structuring and those kind of structures are generally susceptible to changes in the law, be it tax laws or other laws. And so innately, when you're involved in more complex structuring, you have to be aware that you're going to have to constantly review and potentially revise your structuring. And if you change a verse and don't deal well with having to constantly tweak your structures, it's probably best to not spend the time and money implementing them. It's only going to cause you and your family frustration and unhappiness. But if you do elect to use trusts and structures in your planning, as I've said, you can have those both locally and offshore. And it's important that those are also uh, regularly reviewed and that you do a sense check to ensure that they're still working and that they have, have a valid place in your plan. You need to review your beneficiaries. Uh, you need to ensure that the governance of these structures is in order, uh, less so with an offshore trust. It's really important that you not seem to be controlling or making decisions relating to offshore structures because of the tax consequences. But if you have a local trust, for example, and you're a trustee, you need to ensure that that trust is properly governed and that there's no chance of someone trying to say it's an alter ego trust and you calling all the shots hiding behind your trust. On the issue of trusteeship, it's really important to consider trustee succession planning as well. Who would take your place as trustee when you're no longer able to act as trustee? And, and are they aware of the objects of the trust, what the intention is, how beneficiaries should be treated, and other policies that may have been put in place around the trust? 
these kinds of issues can be conveyed in a letter of wishes to your co-trustees, which isn't legally binding. But it, I find it's often most effective to start introducing your succeeding trustees while you're still alive and while you can share with them in person at trustee meetings how things are working and, and how things should be achieved. And again, you need a holistic estate plan to, to deal with all these moving parts and make sure they all fit together. And again, that's why it's useful to have an advisor who can almost project manage the different parts of your estate plan and ensure that they're up to date and that they work for you and for your tribe. So going back to basics now, what kind of documents can you use in your estate planning? Um, at the simple end or the basic foundation of an estate plan is a will. And you need to have a will in place with an executor nominated that also dictates who your heirs will be and what assets they will inherit. Um, and taking into account all those scenarios we, we chatted about a bit earlier, uh, it's important to regularly review and update your will. Again, it's an organic document. It needs to change and adapt as your family's needs change. Again, trust deeds are important. So if you have trust as part of your estate plan, and it's good to review and check those regularly as well, because they're subject to the law and the law is evolving and changing. Other documents which you can consider using as part of your plan to, to transfer assets or to manage assets, um, I think like a power of attorney. And I think at this point, it's really, really important for me to draw to your attention the fact that there is no such thing as an enduring power of attorney here in South Africa. So you do get an enduring, enduring power of attorney overseas, but in South Africa, your power of attorney, your general power of attorney that you grant to your agents ceases to be valid either on your death or when you lose mental capacity. And by that, I mean you're no longer mentally competent and you can't actually ratify the actions of the agent to whom you granted the power of attorney. And this obviously can pose a big problem, particularly as one gets older perhaps if there are issues around Alzheimer's or dementia and you no longer have legal capacity, your family can no longer use that power of attorney as a tool to help you administer your affairs. And then it may be necessary to approach the High Court for the appointment of a curator bonus. Another important thing to bear in mind is that banks do not accept powers of attorney. So if any member or your agent can't go into the bank and try and transact on your bank account, using a power of attorney. My advice would be that you take whoever you want to give authority to transact on your account to the bank with you. And of course you have to take those FICA documents. We don't move without FICA documents. And together you can sign the bank signatory forms, which gives a family member authority to transact on your account. Of course, nowadays we've moved away from checkbooks and physically going into the bank. If you have online banking platforms, you can ensure that, that your trusted person has access to those by sharing passwords and that. Obviously, one has to be very cautious uh, around that issue given fraud and, and other considerations, but that's also a way to deal with it. Letters of wishes aren't necessarily only for trustees. You can have personal letters of wishes uh, uh, directed at your family or at guardians of children and so on. And they're not legally binding documents, but they, they're morally binding. And they sit as evidence of your wishes when you're no longer able to articulate your wishes. Uh, another thing that many people have interest in executing is a living will or an advanced healthcare directive. It's important to note that these are not currently legally recognized in South African law. The South African Medical Association does have guidelines to doctors around what to do if a patient does have a living will, um, which generally deals with withholding of treatment in certain circumstances. But there is a bill that was introduced before Parliament about two years ago, aiming to, to make this a more uh, legally accepted issue, and legally regulated issue in our law. And then finally, on documents, a very, very important point. Have you put processes in place to ensure that information can be transferred? Um, I've had a suggestion before where someone very diligently prepared a document, 
advising his family of all the information they would need to deal with uh, his death and, and his assets and so on. And it was on a computer and no one in the family had the password for that. It's so important to ensure that your family knows where to obtain information. Um, when you're working with a trusted advisor, they can help be a repository of that information. But for more personal information, you could perhaps even have a concertina file where you keep hard copies of documents or, or some kind of record or a digital wallet to which someone has access with all your password and other information. And then finally, the last point uh, that I'd like to make around ending well and and leaving a remarkable legacy. My advice would be to not avoid the D word in your family. People seem to have a reticence around talking of, about death and dying. Unfortunately, it, it is a fact of life. And I often think to myself, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And it's important to ensure that everyone is comfortable with the processes that will unfold on your death. Um, it really helps family dynamics to have these kinds of discussions in advance in a more relaxed environment rather than when someone's ill or there's some other situation on the go. Um, have the difficult conversations, help your family deal with the change that will come and to help them realize what kind of life they will live after your death and, and to be comfortable with that. Um, I've observed in dealing with clients who've been bereaved that often the people who deal with that the best are the people who've had the open and honest conversations with their family and um, have almost given their family permission to continue to live a good life after they're not around anymore. Um, so help prepare your family for the transition and, and, and ensure that you can leave a remarkable legacy and, and end well. I presume that's my cue to come back on screen, Hilary. Thank you very much for, you know, sort of, I made a whole lot of notes as you were speaking, but I suppose, you know, just a very high level view, you just reaffirmed how important dealing with this estate planning as part of your wealth management strategy or retirement strategy actually is. It's an inevitable and, you know, I think in so many instances and in so many meetings that we've had is, you know, people push this to one side. It's not a place that they naturally go to. So it's a bit of a leading question, but when's the best time to start with this? Now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's never too late. So if anyone's listening, thinking, oh my word, I've perhaps left this too long, it's a bit late, it's never too late. You can start now. Um, obviously, if you're using more sophisticated estate planning structures, the sooner you start, the better, because you get the benefit of compound growth outside of your own estate. But even if you're not involved in that level of estate planning, do something now and show your will's up to date now, get something valid in place. And just to share something quickly, um, I've had a situation recently where I was asked to help a relative of a Citadel client who hadn't engaged with an advisor and had gone and got one of those pro forma wills that you do handwritten wills uh, for quite a big estate. And, uh, Although you can do it yourself, what's happened in that situation is we've had a delay in the reporting of the estate because the masters queried the fact that there's a handwritten will for quite a big estate. And it just goes to show someone was meticulous, they ensured they had the documents in place, but their plan has been hindered by something they didn't foresee. And that's why it's really important to, to partner with someone who can help you navigate this whole process. Okay, so there's a question that's come on from Frank, and I don't know if you can see it on your side, but it is, has the bill about the living will become law? Can you no, assist? No, no, as far as I'm aware, it hasn't. It was introduced to Parliament in December 2018, but from my research, uh, it hasn't yet been passed. But Frank, what I can do is go and double check that and, and we can get back to you on that. Excellent, thank you. Um, just to remind everybody, to remind all the, the, the listeners that please keep passing on your comments, your questions. If we don't get to deal with them now, we'll try and deal with them later. And one of the questions that was posed, will we get a recording of this? Yes, you most definitely will be sent a recording of this. So there is a lot of content that's been shared so far, so you'll be able to review it in your own time and due course. 
It gives me great pleasure now to welcome our next speaker. Paul Britton is an independent consultant, works closely with Anne, um, had a very active career in forestry and conservation and strategic planning. And I think Paul, like what many South Africans faced this year, got pushed into retirement. Those were your words. Uh, I, I suspect that that was just the unexpected happened in your life all of a sudden. And you, one of my takeaways in our chats is that you, you, you set up a very thriving consultancy thereafter. But what was fascinating for me was your vulnerability and admitting that you went into a form of depression, which is, as you found out, not unusual. But maybe let's start off with that and sort of just talking about your own circumstances and then lead into your, your talk. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. I'm going to start my presentation um, and I'll deal with that. Um, sorry, we're just getting through the technicalities here. You have to go back. Sorry, anyway. Um, Retirement is the most wonderful thing. I've been doing it for 14 and a half years. The first six months didn't go too well, and, and I'll explain that later, but um, it's the most marvelous thing, but um, you have to be prepared for it, and I wasn't prepared for it. I was due to retire at 65, and then I was told you're going at 60, which was a huge shock. But let's go to the great marketing illusion. If you look at these pictures, and you often see them, and I saw one on, on, a, on another company's website the other day, one of these pictures. They, they represent this wonderful time that retirees are having. And when I was searching for couples in retirement, these were the images that kept coming up. They're stock images. And they are not South Africans. Um, well, I must admit, the Indian couple in the middle are actually walking on North Beach in D Durban. So I assume they are... Um, South Africans. But what creates this, the, 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 the industry, particularly the retirement homes or lifestyle villages, as, as they're now called, um, you would come to the conclusion retirement is just a walk on the beach. Well, retirement is full of all sorts of unknowns. And as we all got the shock with COVID, it's one of those things that happens to all of us, but not in, in retirement, it meant a whole big adjustment. But what happened to me was I, when I retired, on the very day I retired, went to the farewell party, I was given a job by the people who had kicked me out at 60 to say, go and do this job for me. And from then, my consultancy blossomed. But six months in, I was suffering from depression. And two doctors said to me, what on earth is wrong with you? You're retired. You, 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 you shouldn't have stress in your life. You shouldn't be worried. And... Just by chance, while I was in the state of lethargy, I was terrible. I couldn't think. I couldn't produce anything. Uh, if you had teenage children, you know that, oh, whatever. That's how I felt. And it was, it was an awful feeling. And what I found quite by accident in the library was a book, The Psychology of Retirement. And having read that book, my whole life changed. And what I found was this. Oops. There's a recognized retirement syndrome known as SMS, the six month syndrome. And that's what had happened to me. I'd lost meaning in life. I, I felt empty. I felt useless. I, my consultancy income had taken a dip. And the doctors didn't know about this. And so this is where my interest began and I thought, okay, what caused this? And I started doing a lot of research and in that research I found out two things. One is it was very difficult to find information on the non-financial aspects of retirement. And second one, I wasn't alone. There were at least one third of retirees suffer from depression. And one study that I found, they found that up to 65% of retirees were in depression. So what we got to do, and what did I do in my life to change this? And my business partner, Marianne Heron, who also went through a horrible retirement, she nearly got divorced, which is something I'll talk about later. We took all 
the information we could find from books and websites and papers from all over the world, and we put this one-page strategy together. And the strategy is more than a plan. The strategy is something that changes as you go along. And, and as, as John said, there are changes in our lives in retirement. And these are all the items that one should look at. And I'm going to go through a little process of just quickly introducing you to these. But we talk about a rewirement core of your life. It's about doing new things. It's about finding a new purpose in life. It's about finding out who you are and where you're going. And the three things are important. Purposeful activity, fun and recreation. That's the walk on the beach and playing golf. But the impression is I'm going to play golf every day. That gets pretty boring. And then personal growth, continual learning. I just want to mention the bottom of the one of the petals of the flower, sorting your stuff, as Hillary talked about. It's about recording all your PIN codes and access to your information, where your will is and who's your executor, who, who should be informed on your death and so on. That's very, very important. And as Hillary said, have a file or have it on a flash drive or something. Okay, we need to go through a process. And this is what my wife and I did together. And say to yourself, and in our book, you'll find more information on this process, but who are you when you take away the identity of your work? You spent 30 years or longer of your life building up your capital, raising your family, um, getting a status in society and so on. But who are you really? Are you a top-notch medical doctor or are you a wonderful watercolor artist? Where are you? And where do you want to go with the rest of your life? Now remember this, you've probably worked for about 30 years. You're probably going to be retired for 30 years and longer. So now, if you haven't got a strategy for the next 30 years, um, you're not going anywhere. And this is where you need to have a purpose in life and where you're going and what you really want to do. Because if you don't have a purposeful activity, you could end up with, like a lot of retirees, bored, boring, and in decline. Now, what choices do I have? Are you like me, that I have to work, to continue consulting, to make money to supplement my retirement income? Are you well off and you don't have to work? Do you want to do voluntary work, as Anne has, has talked about, and being part of the community, and I'll talk about that later. You need to have a purposeful activity. And one of them is volunteering. If you don't need to work, volunteering in your community and society abroad, and John has, has alluded to this, how so many people came to the fore during the COVID crisis and still do. I mentor a young man in Kailija. I can't meet him personally, but say yes to what this wonderful scheme um, provides him with data. And we talk once a week or sometimes twice a week on WhatsApp and we're exchanging ideas and we're building up a life strategy for him. You need to be continually learning. Use your brain or lose it. Learning new things, and I do a lot of online courses through Future Learn. They're free, and you can learn all sorts of things. I'm just finishing a course on food and your brain, which is absolutely fascinating. You need to have fun and recreation. This is an important part. And you need to laugh. Um, really have fun and laugh. And if you down to your last cent for the month and you need new curtains, forget about the curtains. Go and, well, you can't go now at the moment, but go online and listen to Mark Lottering and have some good fun. Personal relationships are so important. There's unfortunate statistics in America and Ireland and in England about divorce after 65. And perhaps we learned some lessons during COVID in the initial stages of lockdown, where we had to live together 24-7, 365. Wife and I are, are, are well trained with this, and it took a while to understand my time, your time, and our time. Your place and my place and our place. Elsebee's sewing room is no go for me. I would love to go in and tidy it up no ways, sorry. And, and I'm in the kitchen. I took over the food. 
friends, family, and community. And this is what Anne has spoken about, being part of the community, part of the blue, creating your own blue zone. But that also relates to volunteerism, being part of the community and giving back to society. That is so rewarding. And those together are the relationships that one needs to look at. We need to be actively looking at our mind, body, and spirit. It's not just about having a medical aid. It's about keeping fit. And there's a wonder drug. There's a wonder drug that keeps coming up in the literature. And it's called walking. Keep walking. And work your, keep your mind going. Have, a, have an actual plan in place to keep your mind going. You need to find a place to stay. And as John has said, you'll probably find it's more expensive to move to a smaller place than it is to stay where you are. And in all the books that we've resourced, this is where the biggest and most expensive and most irreversible mistakes are made. It's something you don't do on the spur of the moment. Um, I have a checklist of all the things one needs to look at when you moving properties, and it's, it's, it's quite daunting. My wife and I are looking at, the, at this now, and it's a nerve-wracking thing to move from a house where you stayed 36 years. And then you need money. Now, I'm not going to talk about money. I'm not a financial advisor, but what I need to emphasize what John said, the core of your financial strategy needs to be a budget. You need to know where every cent is coming from and where every cent is going. And one thing we always say in our workshops is you can live very well on less. Some people get a big script when they see what money they're getting out of their pension. There are so many ways of saving money. And in fact, we are living better than we lived on my final salary. So, but budget, you need to go. And now with the, the COVID um, lockdown, my consultancy has dropped from zero to zero. We need to look carefully at our budget. And what we've found is the cost of transport and running with a car and so on is far less. So we, we're balancing the budget, but we need to do that. And we need to do that together. Now, are you all looking? Are you all listening? John and Hillary have spoken about this. The secrets, there are lots of secrets. And I did mention having fun and laughing is, is, are two of the secrets. And on our Blomiki there, there are lots of secrets and, and needs for retirement. But this one, please remember this. When you go home, or when well, you are at home, hopefully, um, think about this. Remember this. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And maybe you've read the book. In retirement, this is even more the case. There's a, a wonderful study done on expectations of retirement between men and women. And there's a list of 25 things. On that list of 25, there are only two that coincide. Men and women want to travel in retirement. And even then, there are differences of opinions. Daddy wants to build a yacht and sail the world, and mommy wants to go on a luxury cruise. So this is so important, and this is the secret. You need to have a shared retirement strategy. This is one of the mistakes I made. It was all in my head. My wife ended a clue that we were short of money. She didn't know what I was intending to do. And we just chugged along until I had my crash in six months. So write this down. Burn it into your brain. It's something that's absolutely vital. But will your strategy ever materialize? You need to have a beacon. You need to have something, a dream that you are swimming towards or walking towards. Walking's better. Mind you, swimming's pretty good, but um, you don't have to run. Maybe you're a marathon runner and you want to keep running, but you need to know where you're going. And in that, you've got this beacon or the lighthouse. And, ah, oh, well, I almost want to go back to the previous slide. Sorry. There's a deliberate mistake in that headline. Will your strategy ever materialize? And I just want to hammer the point. It's so easy to forget. Will your joint strategy ever materialize? And to do that, you need to set goals and set joint goals. John did mention this. And the most important thing about goals, and there's a whole lot of things about goals and setting goals in our book, um, is 
you need to write them down. Even if you write them down on a piece of paper and stick them on this fridge with a magnet, it's no use saying, I'm going to lose weight. You need to set a target of when you're going to do it. So we can come to the conclusion retirement is more than just a walk on the beach. And as our book says, we need to rewire our future. We need to be constantly thinking of new things and who we are and where we're going, and what talents have we got, and what can we give back to society. And if people ask me what I enjoy most about retirement, all the 14 and a half years, apart from the six months, so it's 15 years that I've been um, out on my own with my wife, and she has her own little business that we're going, but it's freedom of choice. It's one of the mistakes I made. I, I've taken on work that I hated doing when I was working full time. I got a call the other day, please take on this job. We'll pay you handsomely, but we want you to prove that we didn't make a mistake. I said, sorry, I'm not taking on this job, even if you're going to pay me an absolute fortune. And that's my sum for today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Paul. Um, you know, I, I, the challenge for, for, for many of us is, as I said to you the other day, is that, you know, I, I'm not living in retirement. So uh, it's the lessons that we've learned throughout the 27 years of talking to people like yourself and, and sort of adapting and adjusting and, and, and learning from. I, I've got a, well, the first, just as an observation, is I think the whole audience, when you mentioned the word wonder drug, Whatever they were doing, and if they were distracted at that point in time, just looked up and said, what is he talking about? It's, it's, don't tell Donald Trump. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Let's not go there. That's going to get us sidetracked. But um, the point is, I don't suppose there is a wonder drug. Um, and so what I would like to know as a question from well, that I'd like to post to you is that you were in that slump. What, what happened? What did you do to sort of turn the corner? What got you out of it at that point in time? But what got me out was finding that book, The Psychology of Retirement. And I dug more and more and more and found more and more books. And they keep gave, giving me the same message as being of keeping your brain active and doing what you really want to do. I'd taken on a job um, at the time I didn't realize um, consultancy does this. It's feast and then famine. And I was in a famine. There were no jobs coming in. That made me feel unwanted, useless, unproductive. How am I going to carry on? Because I need this extra money, but it wasn't coming in. So I took on this job that I hated when I was working full time. And that's one of the things one needs to do. So what are you good at? What do you want to do? What are your talents? What are your skills? And what do you hate doing? And don't do those things you hate doing. You know, just rather, in fact, it was about two years ago, I spent a year with no consultancy whatsoever. There were lots of offers, but it was my freedom of choice to say, no thanks, I'm not going to bore myself and frazzle my brain on something I don't like doing. And mm -hmm. I, the other mistake I made was learning that my, my plans were in my head. My wife didn't know about them. And when I told her eventually that we were short of money, she said, still a so what? And that I'd been worrying about all this money and didn't worry her. And yeah. what, what was interesting was her career as a seamstress took off. And she was involved in the most amazing theatre productions. And she grew. And I had to give her that space to grow. And I think that's so important in relationships. Women have totally different ideas to men. But my problem was, was, was I was burning myself out. Um, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Um, I was working flat out because there's money. Hey, there's money was coming in. Um, I never thought I'd ever be that worth to to an employer, and um, that was marvelous. But I'd, I'd lost sight of the fun and recreation. Okay, and that's so important. But the, the, oh, thank you. The, 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 um, so we will probably pick up on one or two of those points in our panel discussion. We're going to go to our last speaker in, in I'm going to introduce him now, just to remind you, throw your questions on any of the, the sessions that we had so far, and we'll pick up on them in, in about 15 minutes or so. But it gives me great pleasure to introduce a longstanding colleague of mine, Rianne Campbell, 
Uh, I've known Rian for many, many years. Rian is the longest standing advisor in the Citadel business and Citadel Investment Services. And if I use the analogy of the mountain, has walked the journey for so many of our clients from the start of retirement all the way to the end of their days and has more probably wisdom and experience in this space than, than any other advisor in the group. And so, Rian, you've in your sort of timeline have picked up on a couple of points that speak to the all time lows and getting people to try their best to avoid them. Um, and so I hand over to you to share your wisdom and insights as to what those all-time lows are and how best to avoid them. Yeah, thanks, John. <clears throat> nice to, um, thank you for the opportunity. Nice to listen to all those speakers. Uh, it's quite fascinating information coming through there. Um, <clears throat> what we're going to talk about today is um, you've spent your lifetime uh, accumulating wealth and building up your retirement capital and you, you've come to this the pinnacle of your wealth the pinnacle of accumulating everything and then there there are just one rule you you got to follow is don't lose money and avoid disaster so what we're going to try and do in this last session is just to to highlight those risks you face um, to um, those that that can have a, a material effect on your uh, retirement. <clears throat> so I'm going to start my slideshow. Um, I hope mine works. Let's see. Start. Right. So we call it avoiding the ultimate lows, improving your chances of staying wealthy in retirement. Um, JP Morgan did a study on wealthy families and found that only a, a small percentage of families managed to increase their wealth or maintain their wealth. And they simply call it uh, beating the odds. So we call it improving your chances of staying wealthy in retirement. Before we go there, um, I just wanna, wanna touch on a short note on wealth creation. How do you actually get to this point where you now find yourself in a position to retire and you think you've got enough capital? Um, how did you get there? And just one slide on that. On the left-hand side, you take opportunistic risk to build a business, um, to build a career, and um, put all your energy into one thing for, let's say, 30, 40 years. Um, you, you, you take up shares in your own company, you, share, you take up shares in a partnership, in a listed company, you spend all your, your time and energy building up this um, business, and then you also use the bank's money to gear up for growth. Over time, you accumulate assets, uh, uh, lifestyle assets, uh, your house, and your holiday home. And on the right-hand side, bottom right-hand side, an investment portfolio. So when you stand back at this point where you now take the transition from accumulating um, to using some of these money, um, your funds, you actually have business assets for those that, that have business assets, and then lifestyle assets and an investment portfolio of some sorts. Um, it will be a retirement fund or discretionary investments. So we then look at the risks to preserving your wealth and your lifestyle, because I think that's important. And I also think it's a nice way to end this session. And you'll also notice there's a lot of overlaps um, in, in um, Hillary's presentation, um, in Paul's presentation. Um, now, investment risk um, will always be, be present. Markets go up and down by um, huge percentages. They're, they're volatile. What we're going to focus on today is the uh, material risks to your wealth and how to remain wealthy over time and to be able to um, achieve your retirement goals. There are eight material risks we're going to highlight and um, I'm going to start with the first one. So the first one obviously is spending or overspending. Now some families think that um, investments will save them from the uh, spending strategy. Unfortunately, it will not because investments aren't predictable and they can remain very, very um, flat for, for a number of years. They can be flat for a decade and then in the next decade, um, surprise on the upside. So we think of, of, of spending in terms of uh, taking stock of your investable assets. That's the, the starting point of all our financial planning. We then 
we then know that if if you have to define it, spending is a function of investable assets. And you can see the arrows pointing to the left there. Spending is a fun function of your investable assets. And so we think of spending as a as a percentage of those investable assets. Now the rule of thumb we use, um, which we think is quite reasonable, um, which you can use is retiring in your mid 60s is probably a, a withdrawal rate of about 5% on your investable assets. Now, if you want to sound clever and you want to use it at the bry, uh, five times 20 is 100. So how much do you need to retire on? Um, it's 20 times income required per year, income per year required, uh, pre-tax, of course. We believe that the 5% is reasonable um, Anything lower than 5%, right? a 4% withdrawal rate um, and, and lower, uh, you've got a very good chance of sustaining your wealth uh, throughout your lifetime. Anything higher than that, 6 7%, we've got to do financial analysis just to make sure that you don't um, outlive your money. As they say, um, the risk is that you don't die. Um, Managing the risk of, of spending uh, is managing the risk of inflation. So your portfolio has to include inflation beating assets. It's got to be a diversified portfolio. Um, you've got to be flexible in your spending. And I think Paul also uh, alluded to that flexibility. Um, take stock of your spending as well. Um, and then, of course, um, looking at your overheads. Overage is quite important. So when we when we look at budgets, we always find something that makes up the biggest portion, and we try and fix that. It's sometimes um, the cost to to own the home or to live in the bigger home, and maybe moving elsewhere to, as Paul also said, to retirement village, uh, do the sums, maybe moving out to, out of the big city, um, and those kind of decisions you got to take. All right. The second material risk we we look at. Um, was also highlighted by by Hillary. That's family dynamics. Now, she also spoke about the succession planning. So for us, um, you know, families, um, there's a lot of actions and interactions in families. Not all families live in harmony. Um, but, but you know, in most families, you'll also find um, some family members have a, 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 an income requirement um, from the from the family wealth whether it's a parent um, or a child, those can be quite draining on the on the retirement budget. So be 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 aware of that. Succession planning um, is important if you have uh, business assets that you want to pass on to the next generation. Um, and the biggest risk in 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 most families is that one person makes the um, the decisions and uh, the dominant person making all the decisions and fails to groom um, the, the upcoming generation to take over. Now, also um, not educating the rest of the family of what's going on in the family uh, finances and the family investment portfolio. And then when, if a sudden um, turn of fate um, happens and, and the person gets ill or um, there's death or disability, um, then nobody knows what to do. Um, so the best thing we can we can advise here is make sure everybody understands your plan, everybody's on the same page, um, and um, that this area of your life is taken care of with effective planning. <clears throat> Just want to take a support here. The next risk we we highlight is concentration risk. Now this is probably the the most important. Um, aspect of financial planning when you enter or when you exit your uh, working career and you enter retirement concentration or having all your eggs in one basket now concentration can be in any form um, it can be a collection art collection uh, collection of cars uh, exposure to one property a listed you know a one a listed property a single property a business shares on the jse or one share on the jse and it could be a very successful company like naspas only going up or mostly going up or it can be a company on a rocky road like Cecil, um having to sell part of the um, lake charles uh, business um, currently and companies are exposed to a lot of things um 
companies are exposed to management decisions, but mostly from external factors. And those external factors are um, hard to, to um, you know, to, to, to predict because you, you, you're looking at regulatory changes, uh, changes in demand, changes in industries, changes in economies. But it's that one event that can knock you over and can change the rest of your life, which we call a black swan event. And if you look at 2020, um, the COVID-19 event is exactly what you should be looking out for. Um, in other words, if you, if you look at a, a single share on the JSE, it could have been hit by by the COVID-19 um, events. It could be in the traveling industry. It could be in in, in, a, in an industry that is so hardly hit that your whole um, wealth and your retirement plan gets derailed. So you have to diversify. It's hard to diver diversify, but you have to. Now, sometimes it's for um, sentimental reasons and sometimes it's for uh, the, the fear of capital gains tax. Now, uh, fortunately, we have sent some techniques to mitigate the risk of or the, the payment of capital gains tax, just to postpone those um, and still be able to diversify. So, concentration for us is is one of the major things we look at when we uh, build a financial plan. What goes hand in hand is leverage or gearing, where the bank dominates everything. Now. If you have assets that um, that are highly geared, like a rental property and the income dries up, um, or a listed property, um, you know, and, and the prices fall, and shares up for um, security or collateral at a bank, and the share, shares fall like Steinoff, um, you will be a forced seller. Um, now, forced selling means that you are actually uh, realizing the losses where you otherwise under normal circumstances could have waited for the for the value to 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 recover you uh, the bank will force you to sell at a loss and that's um, one of the things that uh, we believe it's a, it's a two-edged sword it increases your potential for higher returns but it also increases the risk the next one we look at um, the fifth risk is taxes of course and Hillary's um, has highlighted that as well. Now, um, you got to implement a, 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 an effective plan um, to, to minimize your taxes. There's income tax, there's income tax, and there's wealth taxes. Governments can impose wealth taxes at any point. Um, th there's tax on the transfer of assets. Now, those include the nation's tax, estate duty, um, inheritance tax, as they call it in America, and then CITES tax, where uh, um, an asset is situated. Those taxes can be as much as 40%. So it's a significant hit um, if that happens to you. Capital gains tax in some uh, jurisdictions are levied on an ongoing basis, on a regular basis, like five years or 10 years. In our case, fortunately, capital gains tax is only levied at the disposal of an asset. Now, internationally, um, there are no more tax havens. The, we're looking at the CRS there, common reporting standards. Um, governments and authorities are exchanging information. So there's no place to hide. Um, you taxed on your global income. And then the one thing that remains is ownership structures. And Hillary's also taught, spoken about that. Now, and, and I like the word that she, she framed or coined, uh, your complexometer. Um, what you've got to be aware of in these ownership structures is complexity, uh, flexibility, and liquidity. And you've got to ask yourself the questions: um, Is it consider? You know, you've got to consider uh, simple strategies like uh, life insurance. Is it not even um, as a replacement to, to structures? Is life insurance not the answer? Um, and you've got to turn complexity um, to your favour. A, a point. Um, advisors that can take that can show you the best way um, to minimize your tax or use tax friendly jurisdictions and then of course um, look at the trade-off do you actually um, give up control for the benefit of a tax saving and then of course um, does the strategy make economic sense um, that's important the next risk we highlight 
is scams and scandals and Ponzi schemes because that happens all the time. Rob Rose, the um, deputy editor of Financial Mail, describes it as rich people doing stupid things with their money. Now, um, South Africans have, have not been spared by these. Now, Charles Ponzi, uh, just a little bit on, on the story of, of Charles Ponzi, where he comes from. He was an Italian immigrant in the U.S. in the 1920s, um, served a couple of jail sentences, um, even failed his father-in-law's uh, fruit business. And in his writings to international uh, correspondence, he received a letter from Spain, um, and which had a, a few stamps in. It was a postage reply coupon, bought at 35 cents in, in Spain, but then you could exchange those at a 10% profit um, in the US for US stamps. And he re realized if you bought enough of those, you could actually make a lot of money by selling the US stamps eventually. Um, he couldn't find finance for his business and then um, so the banks wouldn't uh, accommodate him and he then went on to, to offer higher rates than the banks. So he offered very, very high rates and of course started with his family and started with uh, people he knew and the money was pouring in. And um, it lasted for about between nine months and a year and the money was flowing in so rapidly and um, generously that if he had bought the stamps, he had to fill um, a few Titanics with, a, with the amount of stamps he would have had to buy. Then all of a sudden, somebody noticed, but nobody's selling stamps in America. And then that was the end of Ponzi. Um, you know, we also look at um, what you what what we normally find is that people are attracted to these with higher interest rates or higher guaranteed rates. And people um, kind of, the fear of missing out um, and greed, those things lead people to, and it's sometimes desperation. And, and you always hear um, when the scam, the sandal or the scam gets exposed, um, there's always pensioners involved because they're looking for high returns. So you've got to be looking out for um, these. And, and I think higher guaranteed returns are, are the clues to those. The next scandal, uh, the next um, material risk we talk about um, is currency risk. Now, what you'll see on the screen, um, obviously a currency currency movements can take you by surprise. A currency can drop rapidly and unexpectedly, but also in, um, rise rapidly and unexpectedly. Now on the screen, you'll see the um, a graph of the RAND since 1995 to now, starting at 3 RAND 65 and ending at 16.65. And I think that's about the exchange rate today. Um, so it's a depreciation of 6% per year over the 25 years. Now, we all know that uh, theoretically a currency's depreciation takes place at the difference between um, South Africa's or, or the one the difference in inflation rate. So the difference between South Africa's inflation rate and the US was about four percent per year over this period. The other two percent can be ascribed to um, changes, uh, differences in productivity, and um, maybe political reasons uh, uh, or whatever. But that doesn't matter. If you find yourself at the wrong end of a currency movement, it can materially affect your wealth. Like in 2001, the rand fell within within about two months. The rand lost 50 percent. Um, went from eight rand to 1384. Now, at that point, people would think it just goes one way, um, but then it 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 turned around and appreciated by 50 percent to six rand. And 10 years later. The rand was at seven rand. So it just shows you uh, a currency can take you very unexpected. So we believe you should get a, a currency of reference. In other words, if you um, if you spend in, in a specific currency, you, you need assets that um, that match the liability. Um, a currency of reference, if you intend to go and live overseas, you should probably have um, a portfolio measured in, in hard currency like dollar. Um, 
some families like to have two portfolios, one local, one offshore, and you measure in, in, in different um, currencies. So those are the things you can do. Um, we also have techniques to, to hedge the currency. If the, if the currency strengthens dramatically um, from an undervalued position, we, we're in a position to, to hedge some of that downside for ourselves. The next risk and the last risk we, we, we highlight, the material risk, obviously is sovereign risk. Now, this is not only a South African thing. This is a global thing. It happens all across the world. And um, the, the, the kind of things you've got to look out for when, when radical changes take place is for radical tax increases, expropriation, um, the um, exchange controls, reckless fiscal and monetary policy, and that will cause hyperinflation. Now, a case in point is Venezuela. Venezuela was a was a very um, uh, stable country after the, the Second World War for 40 or 50 years. It's rich in oil, reser um, oil reserves and probably one of the most stable um, countries in the world at that point in time. Um, but by 2019, the country had fallen into um, the worst humanitarian crisis uh, tragedy that we've seen in a hundred years um, around the world. Um, the country at, at that point, um, GDP has, had dropped by 50%. Um, unemployment was at 44%. Um, the poverty rate was at 90 percent there was a shortage of food there were no medical expenses all brought by um, the radical and populist macroeconomic policies of president Hugo chavez um, who was um, president from 1998 to 2013 until he died and then taken over by nicolas maduro so um, that's just an example of what can happen if the wrong macroeconomic policies are, are followed. Just another example, we are all global citizens now. So you, you could have been affected by having money in a, in, a, in a bank account in Cyprus. And if you woke up on the morning of 25 March 2013, you, might, you would have seen that your bank account had a haircut of 10% because the Cyprian banks, bank, Cyprus, the, the old bank system of Cyprus had to be bailed out by the European Union, um, but they weren't prepared to give them the full amount. So they had to, so Cyprus had to come up with 7 billion euros um, and they just took it from the, the bank deposits. Now, obviously, why did they lose money? They invested um, their depositors money in Greek bonds at the time. That was the Greek debt crisis. Um, so if you what the, the 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 risk can be mitigated by investing assets in in um, f um diversifying the the physical assets you have into different um locations in the world so if you if wealth preservation then counts as one of your retirement goals, acknowledge the risk and manage them and get yourself a, a, a wealth partner that can lead you um, and, and um, prevent you from losing capital or uh, losing capital on a permanent basis. Thank you very much, Rian. Um, we have a few minutes to close out the panel discussion. So everybody's going to turn their videos on. I am deeply sensitive to time and sure, the amount of content and insight that's been shared. So I'm looking at each of you on the screen as our, as our panel members. And I'm going to ask you for one closing statement under the umbrella of having a retirement strategy that is fulfilling and effective, and but a closing statement from each of you from your seat of the stadium. So I'm going to keep talking a little bit while you're starting to think what you're going to say, and I'm going to give you all of 10 or 15 seconds, and Paul, I'm going to come to you first, then Hillary, then Rian, and then to you, Anne. But just a, a closing statement to sum up retirement strategy from your perspective. Go ahead, Paul. One sentence. The closing rule is don't try and do it on your own. Have a partner, if you're married, work it with your, your, your wife and your, your family 
and find a partner to help you with your finances, find a partner to help you with all your wills and your estate and so on. Don't try and do it on your own like I did and crash up with that six month syndrome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Hilary? Thanks, John. I think to echo what Paul said, I'd also say have those conversations. Don't avoid the difficult conversations. Rather, uh, chat to your family, whether it's about psychological issues, financial issues, your estate plan. Don't leave things to chance and, and have a situation arise where there are unpleasant surprises for your family when you're not around. Rather be open and discuss things while you can still resolve them. Thanks. Thank you for that. Who did I say next? I'm already forgetting. Did I say you next, Rian? I think it's me. Okay. Yeah. Get a good advisor um, and beat the odds of staying wealthy. <laughs> Happy with that? <laughs> and Anne? I would say it's a long time. It's a long time you're going to be retired and have several plans. Have a short-term plan, a medium plan, and a long-term plan and some dreams and some contingencies as well. It's fabulous. It's really fantastic to be in a position where you're making choices, you're starting new things, you're making some of your dreams come true. Look forward to it. Don't be frightened. Oh, don't be frightened at all. My one takeaway, what you said, dream and continue to dream. Um, and maybe just to close from my side, just to thank all of our panelists for the time and the effort and the energy they put into their sessions and their insights and for, in many ways, making them vulnerable. Um, we really appreciate it, as I'm sure all our guests do. And then to the guests, thank you so much. This has been a long session, but judging by the comments, it's been very well received. We've touched on many aspects. I know there are a number of questions that we haven't got to answer. I'm going to ask that certain people address some of those questions, which are quite specific, and get back to you. Um, and just thank you for your time. We're at we're in October. We're closing out 2020. We're into spring. And from my little colleagues and myself, we wish you well a wonderful end to this year. And let's let's embrace life for what it is. Take care. Look after yourselves wherever you might be in this beautiful country. Cheers. Thank you.